So first we have James Lauren, who is Professor Emeritus of Sociology at the University of Vermont, followed by Gregory Downs, who is Professor of History at the University of California at Davis, uh, Alan Grubb, who is Associate Professor of History at Clemson University, Kate Masur is Associate Professor of History at Northwestern University. J. Drew Langham is an alumni distinguished professor of wildlife ecology, master teacher, and certified wildlife biologist at Clemson University. And Adrian Petty is Associate Professor of History at the College of William and Mary. And so we'll start with uh, Professor Lowen. Well, the first slide is supposed to have my name and my email, and I want it that way so that you can contact me, particularly if, for example, you have a Sundown Town to tell me about. I wrote this book, Sundown Town, so I'm always collecting more of them. Um, or if you have some nasty com or nice comments to make about my talk, or for other reasons. Uh, also, there, and these are the um, four things that I have written that are most relevant to what we're talking about in this um, session and maybe what, what we've been talking about today. Um, Lies Across America, I think, is the best-selling book in public history or about public history. I'm not sure. And so if you have a, a, a competitor that, that you know about, email me about that because I'm trying to do a list of them all and, and uh, nobody's ever done this in public history. Um, the kind of Confederate, neo-Confederate reader, uh, I actually discovered uh, about 10 years ago that the important documents such as the secession statements of every state when they left the Union or other important things like that had never been collected in book form ever. Uh, so anyway, I thought that would be important for the sesquicentennial. Um, five minutes about why the South seceded is actually the most read article in the, at the Washington Post in 2011. Uh, well, the most downloaded, you never know if people read it. Um, and so that might be of some use to some of you. Well, anyway, okay. so. Uh, when I went to write Lies Across America, which came out in um, 1999, and the subtitle is um, uh, What Our Historic Sites, S-I-T-E-S, Get Wrong, um, we lived in a, uh, not only a white, we could say a, a white supremacist uh, public landscape about the Civil War, but about other things too. Uh, there were a couple of exceptions, I won't, don't have time to name them, um, but for example, a Confederate ran the GAR Museum in Springfield, Illinois, okay? which is a ridiculously small and inadequate museum in the first place. The uh, Jefferson Davis Highway went from Alexandria, Virginia, to Georgia, and then across to Mississippi, and then across to Los Angeles, and then up to Seattle, and to the Canadian border. Okay? Um, the furthest north, uh, marker or monument to the Confederacy is not actually in Wisconsin. It, it was then in Helena, Montana, a beautiful stone fountain to our beloved Confederate dead, not counting the uh, granite kind of marker that's at the Canadian border north of Seattle marking the, the Jeff Davis Highway. And, and worse than that, places in the, in the South that had no business having a Confederate marker uh, or a monument, the worst I can think of, there's a whole list of them, uh, Jones County, Mississippi, which some of you have ho hopefully seen a rather good movie about, uh, which more or less seceded from the Confederacy and had to be occupied by the Confederacy, has a Confederate monument at Ellisville Courthouse, precisely where the Confederacy had to occupy the courthouse to, to prevent the uh, secession, secession. And places like Baltimore, uh, now you, will, you can go check this, Maryland never seceded. All right? Maryland did send a bunch of troops to the Confederacy, but it sent two and a half times more troops to the United States. Uh, Baltimore had seven Confederate monuments and one United States monument. Worst of all, Kentucky, uh, you may remember Abraham Lincoln said, I think he said, uh, I would like to have God on my side, but I must have Kentucky. And that's a very profound statement in several ways, both morally and politically. Uh, and Kentucky did not secede. Kentucky sent 35,000 troops to the Confederacy, but it sent 90,000 troops to the United States. Um, as of about 10 years ago, Kentucky had uh, 74 Civil War monuments, two of them for the United States, 72 
for the Confederacy. So the Confederacy got Kentucky, it got it between 1890 and 1940, which is when most of these monuments went up. Um, do I have any others to mention right now? No. I think it was our failure, failure of all of us in this room, failure of all of us who are historians, or in my case, a sociologist who think about the past, uh, that this could possibly keep going and, and go so long. Um, in 1999, I came out in that book uh, for the toppling of Confederate monuments in general and some specific ones. And, it was cons and my suggestion was considered outlandish and indeed, um, my publisher probably tried to dissuade me a little bit from including a list of monuments to be toppled, uh, which I did include anyway. Um, these monuments mostly were put up during the nadir of race relations, which is the period 1890 to 1940. Uh, I think if you, if you read what I've written about it, such as the last chapter in uh, the book that might be for sale up there, I don't know what those books are up there. Uh, some of them are, be, are disappearing, and not mine, but other people's. Um, but maybe they're for sale. There's certainly more than one copy of um, Teaching What Really Happened. Uh, and that's a chapter about how to teach about the nadir of race relations. I think it has to be dated at 1890, um, but whether it, um, where it exactly ends is maybe debatable. Um, but anyway, that's when most of the Confederate monuments, almost all of them, uh, went up. In fact, there's, well, and I wanted to show you one, I have a whole bunch of pictures about the nadir. This is an ad for cream of wheat in 1914. You can see a little white boy whipping, uh, that turns out to be his black babysitter, and saying, get up, uncle. And this is supposed to make us all feel warm and friendly inside, so we buy cream of wheat. And it's just one example of the extreme racism of this terrible uh, era. Well, uh, this is a kind of typical, in a way, standout uh, monument before the Nader. It turns out it has, have, went up just before the Nader, 1889. Many of you know this. Uh, and most of these monuments, this one included, mourn the dead. And this one, and most of them, list all the dead from Alexandria, in this case, around the bottom. There is a problem with it, but it's not. I don't have that problem with it. This is a typical monument from the Nader, OK? And you can see what it is, of course. It's the first of the monuments to go up in um, uh, Richmond on, on Monument Avenue. They're quite different. Uh, we have this term hieratic scale, as in hierarchy. Uh, the feet of the horse are about 40 feet off the ground. The horse is not traveler. The horse is more like uh, Sylvester Stallion, shall we say, muscled on muscled. Um, well, then. Uh, well, I'll leave that up there for a minute. Uh, what happened after 1999? I'm trying to think about a history of public history, uh, or maybe a history of public rhetoric, and how it has changed. Um, even in around 1999, things were beginning to happen, and I've been uh, composing a new chapter for the new edition of uh, Lies Across America about some of those things. Uh, we were trying to get history a little more right rather than white. Um, this is a famous Ill, uh, installation, it might be called, by Fred Wilson called Mining the Museum. This is part of it. This went up in the uh, Maryland uh, State History Museum in Baltimore. Uh, and on the left, you will see busts, if you will, of Frederick Douglass and uh, Benjamin Banneker and um, Harriet Tubman. Uh, but you don't see anything because there's nothing about them, or there was not then, in the museum. Uh, or he was given free reign of all of its warehouses and so on. On the right, you see three famous busts of, one of them is Napoleon, people who have nothing to, whatsoever to do with uh, Maryland, but who are in the museum. And I submit that that makes an impact. It, 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 it's probably the most famous museum installation ever. It resulted in a book called Mining the Museum, and if, if you're not familiar with it, you might want to read it. This is something to look at. Well. Um, We've seen amazing change in the last 20 years, I think, or the last 19 years. Um, that change was particularly accentuated in 2015 when Dylan Roof, as was related, uh, mentioned earlier today, uh, murdered all of those people in this state uh, in Charleston. And that coincided with the BLM movement, Black Lives Matter, of course, um, and this is an example of what happened uh, in Baltimore. Well. This is getting ahead of the story slightly. Uh, the Confederate flag came down, of course, here in this state, in front of the uh, state house. And to the credit of the governor, 
Uh, she didn't give quite the right reason. She gave a right reason that it offended African Americans in the state. But the correct reason, the other correct reason, even more important, is what it did to white folks. Uh, it legitimized the Confederate cause, or the neo-Confederate cause. And that kind of legitimacy led to Dylan Roof at the extreme. And it's bad history. It's white supremacist history. And it's what's got to go. Well, um, this event caused people to talk about Confederate monuments across the country. And uh, this was a Confederate monument. This is the one with both uh, Lee, uh, Lee and uh, Stonewall Jackson, a double equestrian monument on this one. Uh, imagine that they're still up, because that's how they were uh, at first. And in, in Baltimore, for instance, I was the, one of the two expert witnesses for the Baltimore Confederate Monument Commission, which the mayor thoughtfully set up, and she put uh, had put uh, markers in front of each mar uh, monument to uh, tell people, don't do this to the monuments. Uh, instead, testify in front of the commission and gave the email address and all kinds of things like that of how to, how to do that. But it turns out that neither she nor much of the commission uh, had any taste for doing anything. They wanted to discuss the monuments, but they didn't really want to do anything. Uh, and I think we historians were at fault. Many, many of us said, uh, uh, yes, it wouldn't be right to take them down, of course. Uh, we, we should contextualize them. We who had done nothing whatsoever to contextualize them in the 100-year history that they had been up. Well, then came Charlottesville, and I'm really glad that Charlottesville's in the title of this panel, because I think it's so important that I use the term BC for the state of the discussion before Charlottesville. And I think after Charlottesville, it's quite different. And in fact, within three days of Charlottesville, all four of the main Confederate monuments in Baltimore came down. And this happened all across the, the country, actually, including, for instance, Helena, Montana. And here you see it. You see the two monuments down. And I submit to you that, that actually tells more history right now, just looking at it, than it did before. Um, you can look at most of these Confederate monuments, like the one about Lee, and it only says Lee. That's only three letters. It doesn't even say that Lee was in charge of the Confederate Army. Uh, everything else you have to bring to it. It's nothing but celebration. It's not real uh, history. Well. Um, I want to suggest that Mayor Landro, when he took down the four Confederate monuments in New Orleans shortly after Charlottesville, uh, made a wonderful statement. How many of you have either heard or read his speech? Excellent. Well, then you don't have to. Uh, but the rest of you do. Uh, and, it's, and it's well worth your attention. Uh, here's one that you po folks in South Carolina need to deal with. And who better than the ones in this room? Even those of us not from South Carolina, we can attack from afar. This is South Carolina's monument at Gettysburg. And it is full of what we in sociology call BS. Uh, <laughs> that is bad sociology, you were thinking. Um, you can, re can you read that? I'll, I'll read it. Uh, abiding faith in the sacredness of states' rights provided their creed here. That's straight. Not, uh, nonsense, as you know, because you've read uh, what South Carolina said as to why it was leaving the United States. It was leaving precisely because it was upset with states' rights. They list the states and the rights that those states tried to exercise that really upset them. So this is 180 degrees wrong. And furthermore, this is not covered by the South Carolina Heritage Act, which makes it so hard to change monuments that are within the state of South Carolina. So it's maybe a good one to start dealing with. Uh, I'm wondering if South Carolina anywhere has done anything like Richmond is beginning to do. This is a triangular monument for the triangular trade, actually. Uh, it's called Reconciliation. And there's three of these monuments. Are you familiar with this? This one's the one in Richmond. One is in Benin in West Africa. And one is in Liverpool uh, in England, uh, covering the three, the three bases of the, of the triangular trade. And not only are they terrific, but the process of putting them up and talking about them was also terrific. And Richmond is doing some various other things. Uh, I want to say again about the change in um, uh, rhetoric that uh, I was part of a panel that actually did get somehow onto CNN uh, in Richmond. Uh, you can go watch it on TV still. Uh, that met to, discussing uh, what to do about Monument Avenue. And the mayor said shortly before we met, uh, removal is not 
on the table. Uh, I insisted on going last there, and I put it back on the table, but, uh, but people thought that was dumb of me. Um, but then, after Charlottesville, two days later, the, the mayor says, removal is on the table. So Charlottesville has, has helped us. Uh, it helps us make uh, the changes that we need to make. Uh, so I have some modest proposals from Civil War monuments in South Carolina. Uh, I would suggest that you take them all down, every single one of them, and that you put them, maybe you, you have so many that you can have more than one Nader Park, but a park that says, the Nader of race relations, and then each monument says, here's an exhibit, for instance, from 1923 or 1911 or whenever this one went up, and tell what, why it went up, and you will find it in almost every case. At the dedication, there was an errant white supremacy in the dedicatory speeches. Uh, it was clearly put up in order to declare that this space, such as this space right in front of the state capitol, or right next to the courthouse, this is not everybody's public space, this is white space, uh, et cetera. So that would be one idea. Um, I don't think you should just leave the empty marker, although, I mean, the empty plinth or, or base, uh, although they, those are kind of cool, you should leave those. But you should put up a marker in front saying what was there, when it went up, so why it went up during the Nader, and when it came down and why it came down. And that tells a whole bunch of history, okay? Uh, in that Nader Park, I think you need to talk about the Nader and use the word propaganda, which is what those monuments were. Uh, add to your, well, add some African Americans and anti-Confederate or anti-racist whites. Their history has been lost, and every state has some of these folks who took some remarkable risks during Reconstruction or during the Civil War. I've already mentioned the last one. What that last slide was was the verse from we shall overcome that says the truth will make us free. And I didn't know if I had the, I know I didn't have the guts to sing it for you, um, but I thought I'd put it up there. It just simply said, and thank you, but it says the truth shall make us free, and it says that two or three times, and then it says deep in my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. I think we are in the fortunate situation that the more accurate we tell history, the more accurate we tell the history of reconstruction, for instance, which we are in the sesquicentennial of, uh, the more anti-racist our public landscape becomes. Because in fact, black folks did nothing wrong during Reconstruction. Uh, in fact, Reconstruction was a time of wonderful possibility. So one other thing that I think we all have to take as a charge from this whole meeting, both today and the, the, whole, the whole week, uh, is that we shall, during the next well, 10 years, because the, luckily the the sesquicentennial re reconstruction lasts a long time. Um, we shall get every part of our country uh, involved in telling the accurate story of reconstruction. One comment on that, even the North participated in reconstruction because reconstruction was really two things. It was, of course, the political reconstruction of the southern states, but it was also an ideological movement across the country that said black folks should have equal rights. And on that basis, elections were won in 1866 and 68 and even thereafter. Uh, and then we need to tell the story of what supplanted reconstruction, and it didn't really supplant it until 1890, and that's the nadir of race relations. Uh, and most people don't even know that term and have no idea about it. And when we're doing all this, we're, telling, we're giving people access to the most important single tool that empowers them about the past, and that's historiography. And we can teach them that word. I've taught it to fifth graders. They understand it. And we can teach them that concept and that power of thinking for themselves. And then we'll be using this whole public history controversy to make our nation smarter about the past and hopefully more just in the present. Thank you. Kate and I are going to, uh, since uh, we'll be talking about projects we have worked on for several years, uh, five, at least five years together, we're going to um, do this, uh, do our presentation together. Ours is, uh, is relatively brief because we do want to make sure we leave time for discussion and to hear from the audience. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so um, what we were here in the, asked here to talk about is our work um, in trying to continue the process to create um, spaces for historical memory of reconstruction in the national park system. So we entered um, at a moment uh, well after that uh, process had been started. Uh, Eric Foner, who's here um, in the late 90s, um, had been central in a line with uh, people on the ground around Beaufort, South Carolina. Um, 
and on St. Helena Island, and with Congressman Jesse Jackson Jr. and Secretary of Interior Bruce Babbitt. And there had been a very significant, serious um, and uh, uh, you know, effort throughout the uh, about from then until about 2004 um, that really had a lot of momentum, and then was uh, was crushed by uh, vagaries of South Carolina politics, probably better known uh, to you all. Um, and so, in um, about 2012 or 2013. Um, Kate and I, as we were, like, like many of us, uh, kind of going around and then speaking at 150th um, anniversaries of different Civil War events, um, we're interested in figuring out how to turn this, not just to get up and talk about Reconstruction, whether they wanted us to or not, um, but how to figure out how to turn uh, to create some momentum uh, for anniversaries of Reconstruction. And so with the help of Jim Grossman at the American Historical Association, he helped us connect with uh, some of the National Parks people people who had been involved uh, in the movement with Congressman Jackson and with, uh, um, with Eric and with others, uh, and who, many of whom were, some of whom have since retired, many of whom saw themselves as at the end of their career, had been involved in 90s efforts to recast how, to begin to recast how the National Park Service portrayed slavery, um, and saw the work of Reconstruction as their undone work, as the task that, that they had not been able to fulfill, and were eager to try to find time, uh, find, a, find a way to do it. Um, and so, um, with, the, with their help, with Eric's, we were able to convene a group of scholars uh, to get them talking about how to, how to restart momentum. Um, and we were incredibly lucky both to have that um, you know, historical legacy, that there had been this prior movement um, and connections that were made. We're also incredibly lucky in that many people um, on the ground in the Buford area, uh, St. Helena, the people associated with the Mitchellville community um, on Hilton Head and others, um, were extremely motivated to do it. Uh, none of this, you know, National Park Service sites don't work, imposed down upon people. Um, so, the, you know, they were extremely motivated to do it and were seeking ways to connect with scholars uh, and to obtain, again, this sense of scholarly legitimacy. And also, parks people were interested in having a role for scholars uh, to create pressure that they're not allowed by statute, they're not allowed to lobby Congress as, as, as agents of the federal government. So we were able to convene a group of historians to talk with them about how to save time. Uh, they have a lengthy, uh, and understandably so, bureaucratic process to establish um, things that the National Park Service will agree upon, or things like themes that everyone should refer to. They really wanted those documents, because they wanted people across the, you know, across uh, the South and the nation um, to really have something they could point to if someone came in and said, why are you incorporating Reconstruction in this way? Um, those are the kind of things that give them that kind of support and, and power. Those themes were relatively simple for uh, historians historians to uh, work out and to provide for them. Um, and then a group of historians, uh, including several in this room, uh, you know, wrote to different members of Congress um, and sought other ways to create pressure upon Congress um, to allocate funds to get this process moving, which started with the National uh, theme, Historic Landmark Theme Study, um, which then became a document that people can use across the parks, um, and which then helped to move toward some of the next stages. Do you want to take over? OK. All right. Let me, so we're kind of tag teaming. So we get involved with the Park Service. Uh, it, it felt like you know pushing on an open door in a way at that point that the Park Service had felt, as Greg said, that they should have done more. They're the custodians of most of the Civil War battlefields that people visit, and yet they really had no internal to the Park Service, no framework for interpreting Reconstruction. And so whether you were at a Civil War battlefield or a plantation house managed by the Park Service or any historic Park Service site, even if the superintendent, there's a lot of local autonomy in these Park Service sites, and even if the person in charge of the site wanted to do more with reconstruction, they would have had a hard time kind of figuring, finding a framework within the Park Service guidelines to do it. And so um, that's part of what the challenge was and what they were very interested in trying to remedy. So as Greg was saying, we sort of got underway. Um, there were two main writing projects that we were involved in. One was the um, handbook on reconstruction, which is actually back Back there. It's a, an illustrated handbook with essays by a number of people in this room and a number of people not in this room. Um, it's designed, it's for sale at uh, relevant Park Service sites, and it's designed to introduce people in kind of brief ways to central topics in the history of Reconstruction. I 
think it turned out great. The illustrations are particularly um, terrific. And so that was a kind of outward facing product. Although we had the sense that people in the park service were also interested in having that so that they could also educate themselves about this confusing and really important period. And then we also wrote this theme study, which was more of a kind of a broad overview of reconstruction history, um, designed more for internal use within the park service, although it's available online. And if anybody's interested in seeing it, you can kind of Google National Park Service theme study on reconstruction. And it's kind of an overview of reconstruction history, which will be familiar to most people in this room, divided into the six themes. And that was designed in part to undergird an effort um, by the time uh, sort of 2016 was happening to persuade President Obama to create the first national monument to reconstruction through executive order under something called the Antiquities Act. Because although a more kind of conventional way of creating a new national monument is to go through Congress, there wasn't a lot of hope that Congress would actually pass such a thing in a timely way, especially if they wanted to get it done during the Obama presidency. And so the theme study was designed in a way as a framework for making the argument that this was a legitimate thing, a legitimate topic of history that the Park Service should turn its attention to. And as Greg said, um, it was absolutely fundamental that, um, so it, let me backtrack. We are, part of our job was to describe and the history of reconstruction and its importance, but also to identify existing mostly national historic landmarks that were important for the history of reconstruction and that met the criteria of the National Park Service for a nationally, histor a nationally significant historic site. And we found uh, that the most, the sort of best place to commemorate reconstruction, if you take all of the cr uh, criteria of the Park Service into consideration, was the area around Beaufort, South Carolina. So in the meantime, people in Beaufort were very eager, as Greg was saying, to kind of have this happen. They had been talking about it for um, more than a decade and also had learned lessons. So when we came in and, you know, we were outsiders to this, they had people in Beaufort, historians, public historians, people who work for the Park Service had very specific ideas about how to make the process go more smoothly than it had the first time around. They had encountered a certain amount of resistance um, locally about talking about reconstruction. The Sons of Confederate veterans had gotten organized at kind of the last minute and that had partially led to stymieing the project the first time around. And so there was a really significant local component to this where people who had been through it in a way once before had particular ideas about how to go forward in a, in a more successful way. And in fact, their, uh, the way they handled it, particularly I should mention Billy Kaiserling, the mayor of Beaufort, who was really interested in building coalitions and making a kind of public showing of broad-based support for this if it were to go forward. Um, and so uh, the, the story of the Reconstruction National Monument is that kind of everything miraculously came together through the efforts of um, the southeast region of the Park Service, uh, which is based in Atlanta, through local people, through there were uh, property transactions that had to happen at the last minute. Um, and then this project kind of wended its way toward the White House at the very end uh, of the Obama administration. And on uh, a couple days before he left office, he designated three new national monuments, um, two of which are, uh, recognize the civil rights movement, and one is the Reconstruction National Monument, which is in Beaufort. And so that is, uh, has been, it exists, it's underway in terms of uh, the Park Service doing assessments of what kinds of maintenance. I mean, we, I have to say, I have learned so much <laughs> about how many people and what kinds of things are involved in doing something like this. So you have really old buildings that need maintenance and particularly at the Penn Center, which is this amazing um, historic site that was originally a Freedmen's School, Freed People's School, uh, begun during the Civil War, later became a industrial training school for African Americans and a kind of agricultural education school. And then was um, a, a place where Peace Corps volunteers were trained and also a place where um, black and white activists could meet together during the civil rights movement and Martin Luther King had stayed there. And so the Penn Center itself has, is just a remarkable place and a really, really fitting place to have this. But anyway, so many details involved in getting this um, national monument off the ground and up and running and it's the park service, it takes, there's a lot of complexity and it takes a, a while. Um, in the meantime, I'll just mention one last thing, which is, 
Um, Jim Clyburn has also been a real moving force in this. Um, Representative Clyburn um, actually is the, his district is not quite Beaufort, uh, but Mark Sanford, it, the neighboring district where Penn Center is, is Sanford's district, um, formerly Sanford's district. And uh, Sanford was very supportive of this, but Clyburn was really pushing it in Congress. Um, and got a uh, kind of official recognition of it, even if there wasn't really hope that Congress was gonna create a national monument in this case. Um, but Mr. Clyburn has um, proposed legislation that would turn the national monument into a national park, which is a kind of distinction that's important within the Park Service and kind of cements it, makes it more permanent. And also, interestingly, in this new bill, which actually has passed the House and is right now in front of the Senate, is the proposal to make a reconstruction national network. I don't know if are people in this room aware of the Underground Railroad National Network to Freedom. So what that is is a park service program or idea in which local sites, uh, whether they're run by the federal government, state government, private parties, can connect to this kind of National Park Service program called the National Network, Underground Railroad National Network to Freedom. And that network sponsors conferences, they have a map, they can, it's a way of linking together sites that are not otherwise linked. And that you can imagine with the Underground Railroad, something that didn't happen in just one place, but it happened in many places. Um, recently, actually, during Trump's presidency, he signed into law a national network for, of civil rights sites, which just happened last year. I don't think it fully you know, exists yet. But so now the, the proposal on the table is to create a national network of reconstruction sites. Um, uh, and you know, this, I think, fulfills one of the visions or ideas that, that we had hoped for. And I think that um, uh, Rhonda Thomas's uh, presentation kind of suggests, which is that reconstruction happened everywhere. Um, reconstruction is, a, I mean, certainly everywhere in the former Confederacy and arguably everywhere in the nation. And that the possibility of being able to not just have, you know, one site in Beaufort, but the notion that there would be a National Park Service program that would link reconstruction sites all over um, the South and all over the country is really exciting. Um, and so, you know, our hope obviously is that the Senate will pass uh, in the two weeks or so that they have left um, in this in this congressional session. So even if I mean even if that doesn't go through, there's always a possibility it could be you know put back on the table. And in any event, the Reconstruction National Monument is there and is in development. So uh, that's kind of the story of uh, of our involvement. And yeah, we'd be happy to discuss further after. The I think I was asked here to uh, speak in part because I actually am part of the bureaucracy that has something to do with, that Roger, Rhonda mentioned, that has something to do uh, with the uh, naming of things on campus, because I'm the chair of the, the naming committee or the names committee. Uh, and it is a very uh, complex operation. And uh, I, I think I should point out right off the bat that we do not dename things or unname things, and I'm not terribly sympathetic with denaming things. I think I, I agree with a lot of the stuff that I've heard, and that is building upon uh, these monuments and, and memorials and, and using them to explain uh, historical uh, context. Uh, I'm also an, out, an outlier in many ways. I'm a French historian uh, by training. If you grew up in or around uh, Washington, you grew up with monuments uh, constantly, all kinds of, of monuments. And, and we did, you know, my parents were very interested in history uh, and took us around Virginia, which has lots of, of history. So there were monuments of all kinds. And um, I think I was asked too, because I actually am a graduate of Washington and Lee. Uh, and there was a quite a controversy uh, after the Charlottesville uh, tragedy. Uh, there was a protest there that uh, wanted to uh, rename the university to you know, drop Lee's name. They hadn't made up their mind about Washington, uh, but both obviously were slave owners, so they were uh, in, in bad odor in many ways. And, and, and the university uh, very sagely created a commission which spent about a year and a half. Um, and it came up with, I don't know, something like 58 um, uh, recommendations. They were not demands, they were recommendations. And, and of course, a lot of them were uh, 
perfectly reasonable, kind of like Rhonda's stuff. I mean, they were teaching opportunities and suggestions that uh, institutions um, needed to broaden their perspective on history, uh, not just of the university itself, which Rhonda is interested in, but of the whole community and, and to bring people in. And I don't think anybody would have disagreed with that. They also recommended that a building be renamed, uh, which had been named, I mean, I, I never knew this building at all, but it was named after a, a man who in 1820 gave 20 slaves to uh, Washington and Lee. Uh, they actually never worked on, on campus. Uh, they were sold. Uh, they were obviously treated like property, uh, but they became a part of the endowment. Uh, and, and so one of the recommendations was that the descendants of those particular slaves uh, would be given free tuition. Now, that's probably not a workable idea for a lot of reasons, and, and it was not, a, it, it not well-received by a lot of people. Uh, but I think the, the part of the recommendations that was least well received uh, were those concerning Lee. Uh, for example, that, um, that Lee Chapel, which he built, be renamed. Uh, that uh, the Lee House, where, where he lived and, and died, uh, be uh, renamed, just the house, I guess. Uh, fortunately, Traveler, who when I was there, uh, had been stuffed, and I always thought that was kind of gross to walk by and, and see him in the, uh, uh, in the stable there. But uh, he had been uh, interred with great dignity uh, several years uh, before that. Uh, but that was a pretty divisive uh, thing. Uh, in the end, and, and of course another was that Lee could not be displayed uh, in any form on campus in a military uniform. Uh, which a lot of people thought was kind of unrealistic because he wouldn't have been president, obviously, if he hadn't been a hadn't been General Lee. Now, what the university did was to accept a lot of these recommendations, uh, but stepped around some of the, the really hot ones, uh, which is usually the way institutions uh, work. But it did it did embrace the idea uh, of of building on uh, tradition and not just. Um, uh, getting lost uh, in tradition. I will have to say, when I was at Washington Lee, uh, this was in the late 60s, I don't remember seeing a Confederate flag. Uh, of course, WNL students have a penchant for drinking, so maybe that's uh, the reason. But uh, it, it's a school that's built on tradition, but not necessarily um, the traditions that are now so unpopular for uh, reasonable uh, reasons. The other thing I would say, uh, there are a couple of things that I've seen recently. I mean, this is an article that appeared uh, in, in the Wall Street Journal, Southern Colleges Scrapple uh, with History. And, and obviously that's true. I mean, uh, we all know that. And, and I know it here. Uh, I'm a French historian by training, but I actually have written a lot. Uh, in local history, I, I wrote uh, uh, a chapter on one of the early presidents of Clemson, uh, who actually was a friend of Ben Tillman's. Uh, I know a lot of people find that difficult to imagine, uh, and, and it, uh, endeavored, not always very successfully, to moderate uh, him uh, somewhat. Uh, I also wrote a chapter, a biographical chapter, on Thomas Green Clemson. Uh, I've uh, uh, written uh, an article, a long article, on house and home in the Victorian South and how cookbooks can be used to uh, explain changes in the Southern uh, home after the Civil War. They're really reconstruction cookbooks in, in many ways. And I'm working now on a, a fellow who graduated from here, uh, activist Roy Cohen, uh, who wrote uh, very popular uh, dialect novels about Birmingham blacks in the 1920s and 30s. So, I, you know, which is difficult to deal with in, in many ways because uh, we, I've actually published one, republished one set of his stories. I mean, he made $100,000 in 1930. Uh, uh, so, and he wrote for Saturday Evening Post. I mean, he, he was really a, a, a gifted writer uh, here. And, and in point of fact, he wasn't a racist uh, here, but, but clearly his writing now uh, offends our sensibilities. So I have a good deal of skirting around here. But, but the one thing, I, example I wanted to point up uh, is something that, um, 
that I learned of a couple of weeks ago when, when someone told me of a celebration that they were having in Abbeville, uh, and, and the article here says, as Confederate debate uh, uh, mounts new, mo new monument honoring South Carolina secession comes to Abbeville. Well, Abbeville is where there was Secession Hill, uh, where the uh, uh, Civil War supposedly began, beside the fighting, firing in uh, Charleston. But, um, and and th so they're creating a new monument there. So that's a little disturbing. But I also saw an article that was right after that uh, about Abbeville's Confederate uh, memorial. I mean, every sm small southern town has a Confederate uh, memorial, and most of us don't pay too much attention to it. Uh, but, but that article indicated that there was also a celebration, uh, a, a commemoration, and a, and a big plaque and, and statue of a black man who had been lynched uh, during Reconstruction. Uh, and, and so that's the sort of juxtaposition here in a way that helped, to me, helps explain uh, many of these uh, monuments. Uh, and, and that's kind of the middle ground that I hope a lot of people take. I mean, uh, there's a lot of uh, concern about the naming of, of uh, Tillman Hall, uh, for example. Uh, Tillman was um, obviously a volatile uh, individual. Uh, I've, I've actually read uh, most of his letters and, and the documents in the archives. He's a very complex person. I had a graduate student who uh, uh, was asked to write, uh, to use his letters to his wife uh, as an example, you know, of a kind of Southern marriage in a way. And, and she had found it very difficult in a way uh, to write it because she couldn't understand why this woman loved him. I mean, first of all, he didn't look so hot. He only had one eye. Uh, after all, but um, and he wasn't particularly ashamed of that. If you if you look at pictures of him, I mean, he didn't uh, turn away. He was a self-educated man. They are really sweet letters. I mean, and if you closed your eyes and and forgot that they were written by Ben Tillman, uh, you might think that this is really a nice romance. And I guess my point is that the more I read into him, which is not, of course, to undo that infamous uh, speech that he gave, or to deny that he was uh, a racist or white supremacist. There's plenty of evidence. I mean, he said it over and over uh, again. Uh, but he was, in fact, a very complex, complicated person. He was self-educated. Uh, actually, he did not own any slaves, he was, because he was too young, actually, to have owned them uh, and, and did not inherit the property after the Civil War. But um, he was a very complicated person. He was self-educated. I mean, he was very interested in education, for example. Uh, uh, the building was actually named uh, in 1946 or 47, uh, well before the Civil Rights Movement, and I don't think it was named uh, particularly in defiance uh, of, uh, of of people's attitudes here, but as a recognition of of, of his services to uh, to the university uh, or to the college uh, at the time, uh, and his services. This college would not exist had it not been for Ben Tillman. Now, of course, he's a kind of curse, and we kind of tiptoe uh, around him uh, in, in a way. But there are all kinds of buildings that are named in town uh, after Tillman. There's a motel named after him. I think that's named after him because they don't know anything about Ben Tillman. They just see this iconic piece of architecture and they think that uh, must be uh, something that we should name a hotel. Uh, after. Uh, there's also a, a student uh, a living complex uh, named after uh, Tillman. Uh, I think in that instance, the people probably did know who Ben Tillman was. But, you know, I would hope that there is uh, a, a kind of middle ground here and that, uh, that statues and things are not destroyed uh, but, but used uh, as, as ways of uh, reestablishing reestablishing historical uh, context. A lot of the pictures you saw earlier, uh, a lot of these things, uh, I, I dealt with cookbooks, and a lot of these were written in, women wrote cookbooks in the 1890s, really to build 
monuments like that. They also built schools and they also built uh, other uh, things, but, but it, they were community projects and we need to get at that and reestablish you know, who's really in the community, which is kind of what Rhonda uh, wants to do. I actually have my office uh, in Hardin Hall. Uh, I would point out that Hardin himself was, was a Civil War uh, veteran. Uh, he had only one arm. Uh, he, uh, uh, and uh, uh, he was quite celebrated as, as such. And uh, so that's all I have to say about uh, monuments. But uh, I, I hope that, you know, they're, they're not simply pushed aside uh, because they're momentarily uh, politically incorrect or unpopular. Thank you, and uh, good evening, maybe, I think. I'd, I'd, I'd like to approach this from a little bit of a, maybe a different perspective. I've been in Charlottesville, my wife and I, a couple of times, um, AC um, and BC, but I, I think one of, one of the things, and unfortunately I've not been able to attend all of these sessions, but it seems to me that, um, that reconstruction is still going on. I mean, truthfully. If, if we want to be honest and to not to have to tag history with some endpoint, it's a continuum. And so we're still in the midst of it, clearly. And I, I think a large part of it is deconstruction. And as we, as we talk about monuments, whatever those monuments may be, here, there, wherever they are, um, a large part of it comes down to identity. Who we are, um, from whence we come, what we fight for, what we fight against, all of those things. So. In that light, and I, I have some very personal investment in Clemson University, not only having my whole family having been educated here, have worked here 72 years here at Clemson, and Rhonda, I went into the mansion. <laughs> I graduated several times. But um, one of the things that I found out, um, sort of as a preface, is I, as, I, as I've searched for my roots, as I've deconstructed and trying to understand identity, some of that wound around monuments, um, in particular this university, I have a unique, maybe unique relationship with, with Ben Tillman, in that, that Ben Tillman's ancestors own my ancestors. That's real. So from a slave ship called the Wanderer, heard of that, a yacht that uh, essentially was run aground in, on Jekyll Island in 1858. And at that point in time, that ship, which was bringing enslaved from Africa on dares, really, to say that they could do it, almost 50 years, a little more than 50 years, I think, after legal importation of slaves. Because you see, what happened to my ancestors that came south from Maryland in 1790 is tobacco burned up the soil. And those ancestors were brought here. A grandfather of many greats, probably named Harry, we think. They called him Harry the Happy Slave because he came here with the Lanhams to Edgefield, South Carolina, and they made friends with Eli Whitney. And so they had been set up in Edgefield from about 1790, but then the slave ship wanderer, the slave yacht, get that, the slave yacht wanderer runs, is run aground in Jekyll Island, and those enslaved are quickly dispersed. Some go west into Alabama, into the deep south. Some of them end up on the plantation of Nathan Bedford Forest. You know who that is? He found the KKK. And a few of those enslaved came up the Savannah River and ended up on the Tillman Plantation, including one of them named Lucy, a three-year-old girl. So I'm from Edgefield. I'm at Clemson. I probably have some sort of Tillman blood in me. So I want to talk a little bit about that deconstruction and why reconstruction, I think, is still occurring. This is on a monument. To the memory of Harry, he was born in Maryland in the year 1787, and he died on the 26th day of November 
1860 at the residence of his master, Josias Lanham, Edgefield District, South Carolina. He emigrated to the district with his master in early youth and continued true and faithful to the end of his life. He was worthy of and possessed the confidence of his master. One day I decided to visit my extended family at Republican Baptist Church. The church shared the same nondescript and bumpy stretch of country road as my family's home place, but I had never been there before. On our daring extended bicycle forays as children, my siblings and I had caught occasional glimpses of the white building glowing at the end of Republican Road. Ultimately, however, it was mysterious and off limits to us. The little country church shimmered in the afternoon swelter, nestled among the fading green of late August, the crisp, clean Southern Baptist angles cut through the heavy haze. It was an eerily quiet scene, with the heat and humidity needle winding toward the hellish mark, only a persistent red-eyed vireo and stubborn indigo buntings were still singing. The silence enhanced the surrealism. The pale worship house floated like a mirage on a pond of gummy black asphalt. I had come here searching for long lost family, following Tanya's leads, and Tanya was Tanya is the docent, the historian actually, at um, the Edgefield Genealogical Society. Wonderful, wonderful place. Visit it if you can. My link to all things Lanham, Harry, she revealed, had supposedly been buried here. Allegedly a gesture of gratitude and respect from his kind master. Harry's interment, interment among the Lanhams kept him bound to his white owners, even through death. Had this been a Sunday, a worship day, I would not have made the pilgrimage. Republican Baptist's congregation is lily white, as is the case across so much of the South. God usually sees congregations in separate but equal reverence. While I thought my could-be patriarch would have been happy to know I was there, the welcome from the other Lanhams in both the congregation and the graveyard might have been more questionable. Most of the deceased family I had dropped in on would no sooner have had me over for dinner as called me cousin. I tried to shake off my uneasiness. Surely visiting a loved one's resting place would be viewed sympathetically by anyone, but there was still dread. Maybe it was the stillness, the heaviness of the afternoon and the gathering thunderheads, or maybe it was the rows of miniature Confederate battle flags, little postcard-sized pieces of scarlet crossed with blue bars and white stars coming to occasional life in the slightest breeze. Were the dead watching me? But the draw of connecting, of pulling the ends of my family circle closed was irresistible, and so I lifted the latch of the woven aluminum gate standing between me and the possibilities of knowing more. Lanham is an old English surname. It's uncommon enough that reinforcing its pronunciation, L-A-N-U-M, and spelling L-A-N, as in no, H-A-M, as in Mary, has become routine. But there I was, surrounded by the familiar two syllables. I could see them everywhere, etched deeply into granite monoliths and modest marble tablets. I'd never seen the name so many times in one place. For a moment, I was oddly comforted in all the monuments, almost peacefully reflective, inexplicably so. So many buried here sharing my last name seem to confirm that this place was, is somehow central to who I am, but the scarlet banners of the Confederacy quickly brought me to my senses. I'm a different kind of Lanham. My search took me, after, took me past alleged hero after hero, fallen soldiers from the war of secession who fought for a cause they no doubt believed just. Heroes who claimed the right to independence and self-determination while denying others like me the same. Hero in retrospect would never be the term I choose. I covered ground speedily. Though the cemetery was small with few rows to trod, I found no stone marking the grave of my ancestor. That genealogical society bulletin, the one that pays homage to Harry, paints a picture of blissful bondage and traces Harry's happy immigration from Maryland to Edgefield with his friends to try cotton as a new and exciting venture. It seems like such a happy time. Three chums headed off on an adventure that would make cotton king. But I want you to try this approach instead. Imagine being taken away from your family and friends. They're the people you've known all of your life. They're the people who know you best. 
Their companionship was base compensation for bondage, for beatings, for rape. But then one day you are told that you're leaving them behind to chop and bale cotton instead of cutting and hanging tobacco. That a teenager happily abandoned the familiar is beyond belief. But the bulletin said it was so. It was history in plain black and white. And here I was, black in the midst of lots of white. Did Harry look for his reward in heaven? Did he hope for one last freedom to lie where he chose and spend an eternity, an eternity moldering among his own instead of all these white folks? Being buried with one's owner, the fellow human being who could say, come or go, worship or work, live or die, might have been what he envisioned for an afterlife free of chains. the world and to sustain for all time. Uh, and so I think there needs to be more honesty about the fear embedded within the debate amongst those people who would defend those monuments. And um, I appreciate, and I think there are a lot of people that agree with Professor Grubb. It's the reason why Tillman Hall is still called Tillman Hall. And I think we should stay away from personal attacks. This is not what, these are very serious issues. There are people that don't agree with us. The, the, so um, I would, don't think we need to go there. This is not about Professor Grubb. been in favor of, of new markers that are, are much more uh, comprehensive about uh, uh, about punks and life generally and about the community. So um, it's a personal uh, attack. This is very tough for me because my student is attacking my tennis partner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think this is one of the problems though. We have to talk to each other. And I, I think we do not want to make it a per you may feel that way, but I think in general, if anything, studying the American South should teach us, you are never, ever going to convince people by telling them they're morally wrong or anything like that, whether it's the Vietnam War, whether it was abolitionism or anything. You've got to engage in dialogue, and that's what we're trying to do here. So I think that Peter's right. It, it cannot be a personal I think what would be good is the two of you get together and talk about it as there is no doubt in my mind, I know why. I know he's honest. He believes this. I know Alan well, more. I said he was afraid. That's different than calling him before. Well, I, I, I don't know. It, even though Virginia in D.C., he says it's the South, it's not quite there, and he's not challenging to a duel yet. So let's, let's, <laughs> let's try not to do that. But I think it would be good to get together and talk. But about these things, because I don't think you can have it all the way you want it, though I think if I were African American, I'm not so hard to say, I would think whites have had it their way all this time, uh, and at least let's, let's try to have some dialogue to understand the perspectives. I've got it. This is what, this, that's what education is. That's how Lincoln changed, despite my disagreement with Randy and Eric on this a little bit. I do believe that education makes a difference as you learn and people change again. You know, one, one of the things I made, um, as we talk about monuments, and I was, um, and, and I, I, I think about how, what monuments ultimately evoke. Yes. How, many, how many have been to the monuments um, for, for justice and the Lynch Memorial? How many have been there? Go there and, and be amongst slabs of steel representing all of, not all, a fraction 
a fraction of the people lynched and hung, and then read why people were lynched and hung for looking, or suspected of looking. And it's an uncomfortable truth to be in that place with slabs of steel hanging in the places of dozens of people. That's truth. Now, imagine being in the presence of someone who would have you as chattel. Being in the presence of someone who would see you as no more than a mule or a cow or list you in the register as such. You have to put yourself, and, and, and my issue with, with so many people who may mean well is that they do not put themselves in that place of discomfort. Those words that Rhonda suggests make some people uncomfortable. Simple words make people uncomfortable. If you were a Confederate officer, you were a sympathizer, you stood for certain things. Now, with Tecumseh Sherman, who again was no lover of the, the, the Negro, had certain designs on, on, on traitorous people, probably wasn't erecting statues to them. So if, if we talk about the, this whole history, so as I look at those and you, know, you walk into that monument and here you have people in shackles, and then you walk into all of these representations of people killed simply because of who they were, not just men, but women and children and whole families. And so that's, that's a monument. And you know, I give Alabama an uptick, even though the state has only recently disallowed enslavement. I give it an uptick because it says, you know what, we're going to face these issues. And a few simple words edited out mean everything. For those of us who are writers, words, I mean all of us, mean, words mean everything. To take those words out then says, well, we're going to tell the truth with conditions. So uh, my offer is, is that as we, as we measure and talk honestly with one another, that our monuments have to tell the truth that those monuments have to tell who people were. That Benjamin Tillman said after Booker T. Washington visited the White House that he'd have to kill a thousand niggers. That he'd have to kill a thousand niggers now because... Get them back in their place. You get them back in their place. So that doesn't mean that I leave Clemson, but it means that I want that truth told. Um, doc, Dr. Petty, I, I definitely, right, right here, I'm right, right here, <laughs> but um, I, I definitely appreciate your point about this, the social issues plaguing our um, city, specifically Columbia. I, I was thinking about, I, I went to Birmingham and Selma on a um, history tour with um, Valent, I want to say Valanda Littlefield and Dr. Larry Watson about four or five years ago. And, um, and I remember being in Birmingham and then going back home and, and just doing some further research. They have a major gang problem there with, with Crips and Bloods and everything. And, um, and, and, and I teach for the Department of Juvenile Justice here in South Carolina, and we have that issue there as well. I just think it's interesting how um, you have these sacred sites like a Selma, um, those counties is in the Delta, Mississippi still, and, and you will think that these would be an exception, but they're still being plagued by those by those major issues. So I definitely appreciated that that comment. And I also was thinking about in Colombia, this went viral on the internet. They have these gas stations named after President Obama, and and even then they're in the hood. But even there, you still have these major issues of violence, um, gun violence, and, and, and gang-related activity and everything. So that is a challenge in me um, working at, at that local level with the juveniles and everything. That's a headache that I have that I'm constantly trying to figure out and everything. Um, hi. I, I'm add a little levity here. I, I think ancient aliens built those monuments and then put them all over the country. <laughs> But I, I say this as a joke in the sense that if, if one of our previous presenters is correct, then we have a generation of Americans that believe more in ancient alien conspiracy theories than that racism still impacts the everyday American today. 
And so somewhere when we think of corrective history, it's more than just the monuments and whether they should stand or where they should go or even how we debate them, but how do we build a real corrective in re-educating ourselves to kind of think differently about each other? In the end, one of the pieces of language of the 13th Amendment was the attempt to remove all badges and incidents of slavery, that being skin color and racism, alongside the abolition of slavery itself. So really the removal of racial discrimination. And we think of that amendment as almost being a dead amendment, that once you abolish slavery, minus those little words in between about convict labor and the mass incarceration, it's pretty much over. But we really have a lot of work to do to remove those badges and incidents of slavery to really rethink the way we think about each other. So it does, as Vernon said, require a lot of dialogue and it's absolutely essential. And it's not unique. Um, at Illinois, we have the uh, Chief Alinowick mascot. You would think it would just take the signing of just a sheet of paper to get rid of it. And I was an undergraduate student when the process started and I'm a tenured faculty member now. <laughs> so <laughs> these things, what seems to be relatively easy uh, is deeply complicated through our sociology, the way we interact with each other. But I, I, I joke about that ancient alien thing, but I think that presenter was telling us quite a bit that somehow we have to think, how do we get to the mass public to get them to rethink the way we think about these issues? One last uh, question. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Mm -hmm. I just want to say thank you for the panel. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, you know, presentation of views regarding a very challenging issue. Something I thought a lot about coming from Alexandria, Virginia, uh, where we have the monument to uh, Confederate soldiers. We were just now getting ready to change the name of Jefferson Davis Highway to Richmond Highway. And we're on the receiving end of one of the pillars uh, that's going to be shipped out uh, from the, the monument to the lynching uh, that's in Alabama right now. And one of the questions I have about how monuments are going to begin to impact Alexandria's landscape <clears throat> is how will that monument uh, that we're going to receive uh, from the Lynch Memorial be in conversation with the monument to uh, fallen Confederate soldiers? Are they going to speak to each other? Uh, I guess for me, one of the important learning experiences or opportunities that will come out of this, this kind of maybe like a, like a strange game of chess vis-a-vis uh, -vis monuments is what kind of story they're going to tell, how are they going to speak to each other and tell the, the story of the nature of oppression. And I think that might be a theme that kind of stands out uh, here at, on Clemson University, uh, to have Tillman Hall uh, as a form of monument, but also to have uh, like a monument going up or a placard going up to recognize those African Americans, uh, part of the convict lease system, who actually contributed to the building of the university. Uh, but their experience was directly a consequence of the oppression uh, that was put forth under white supremacy. Uh, so I guess the, I'm not sure if this is a common or a question, but how do you envision these, these memorials, these monuments uh, that exist now that will be built to recognize the African American, African -American experience? How will they speak to each other? And what's the, what lessons will we learn from that? I just wanted to make a comment, not quite in all of here. I want to suggest that you read, you all read, uh, the comments made by, uh, his name, Tony maybe Pearl, but who wrote Confederates in the Attic. Uh, I call this, is, is the Rise Across America, my longest essay in there, is about uh, Confederate monuments, and I had situated actually in Helena, Montana, because that's the most absurd of them all. But I quote him there, <clears throat> because uh, he goes to Todd County, Kentucky, and Todd County is, is of course where Jefferson Davis was born. And Todd County has a huge uh, obelisk uh, that is not as big as, as uh, George Washington's, but it's second only to George because he was the father of his country, Jefferson Davis was, and it didn't it didn't um, send very many troops to uh, the Confederacy. It sent more of its troops to the United States, but it has now become co thoroughly Confederate and uh, has even every year a Miss Confederate contest and all kinds of stuff. And, and you all should read the effect this has on the white folks there. He talks about it. He gets himself almost, well, kind of beaten up uh, by a neo-Confederate in a bar there and so on. 
I don't think that there's any conflict between doing something about monuments and doing something about evictions in Richmond. Uh, there's no conflict between doing something about monuments and whether or not we send m men to Mars either. I mean, there's just no connection between those. We can do something about monuments and we can do stuff about our current social problems. But the effect of these monuments on white folks is not limited to just a couple of totally extreme people, like the guy now on trial for murdering uh, Heather, or the guy who is finished with his trial for murdering all those people in Charleston. They are the extremists, but there's, it makes white folks more racist to have a Confederate landscape, and we need to get rid of the Confederate landscape. We can do that with the back of our hands. It's not that big a project. Baltimore, New Orleans, et cetera, have shown us that. Good. I'd like to thank the panel for very engaging, particularly at the end of a long day, a very engaging, very timely uh, session and allowing time for audience interaction. So now we can all go to eat and drink. <laughs>